place to be is living free, living free in Tennessee. Well, welcome everyone to Living Free in Tennessee, where we talk about building the life you choose on your terms. Today is Wednesday, September 8th, 2021, and this is episode 473 of Living Free in Tennessee, and we are a week out from Green Chili Weekend, and all this stuff has happened. I'll tell you that story before we jump into the main topic of today's show. Today, what we're going to talk about is going back to the land. Some of you are already homesteading, and some of you are dreaming of homesteading, and some of you are like, I'm an urban homesteader, or I love my city life, Sue, and aren't really dreaming at all about going back to the land. But if you've ever thought about it or wondered what it's like, today's a good show for you to listen to. I'll be joined by Matt Hundley, who's a musician, YouTuber, and founder of the Back to the Land Festival in partnership with his fiancée, Gabby, who it would have been kind of fun to get her on the interview, too, so we'll have to do both of them next time. Anyway, it's happening here in Tennessee October 14th through 16th, and that's an event I'll be speaking at about how pantry management's a little different if you're a homesteader versus if you're reliant on the grocery store. I'm going to talk about strategies I have learned over the last 14 years of moving from a grocery weekly grocery shopping cycle to planning for the year on a homestead. Before we jump into that, I want to talk about a couple of things. First, we've got we've got a lot of upcoming events in September. I'm not going over them all today because I want to focus on a couple. One, Green Chili Day is September 18th, 25 bucks. Come out to the Holler Homestead an hour east of Nashville and enjoy a Green Chili Palooza event where we eat lots of good food. We had a glitch in Green Chili del- delivery, so what will happen is that the green chilies, by the way, FedEx stopped working last week. That's what happened. And when I I called the farm I got the chilies from, they were like, I said, you know, they just haven't arrived yet. It's been over a week, whatever. Pretty sure I'm going to get liquid chilies at this point if they show up. And he was like, I'm so sorry. FedEx just had a meltdown over Labor Day weekend. And it started before Labor Day weekend because mine were shipped before Labor Day weekend. Anyway, um, you know, eight days in. No chilies here. So what they did is they refunded my money. They're pursuing uh, an insurance claim with FedEx, but he was going to resend them. And then I said, well, my event is September 18th. So I ended up paying expedited shipping to get them here. What this means is now I know what's happening at the event. I never know this. Like I try to order the chilies in advance and do some of the processing in advance just because it's easier. And then if there's a shipping glitch, which there was the last two years, I, I can reorder. And that has happened this time. So they're probably arriving Friday of Green Chili Weekend. We're serving food Saturday. So you will probably see how we roast hatch chilies here. You'll definitely see. It's not just a canning demo now. We're canning and making salsa. (laughs) That's totally happening. And having a lot of fun. We will, of course, there's always opportunity for aquaponics tours. And you get to hang out with the holler neighbors and really cool network people. If you want to sign up for that, the link's in the show notes. Or go to livingfreeintennessee.com and click on the the sign up button i have changed i have adjusted the site for mobile friendliness it used to be you had to scroll through 10 posts before you saw the event stuff i've made it now appear under the second post so you always see two posts at the top of the page and then events which will be workshops webinars and events and then some more posts if you're looking for back episodes of living free in tennessee podcast that's the first event the second one we are going to talk about today and that is the back to the land festival in hickman county tennessee october 14th through 16th there's a lot to know about this but i'm just going to let you know back to the land festival.com is how you sign up if you decide you want to go to that and since we'll be talking about it in detail in the show i put the link at the top and then of course the website's linked in the bio of the speaker who will be on today which is matt hundley and we'll hear a lot about that soon Next segment is something that came to my attention over the weekend. I want to talk about the Living Free in Tennessee Network. We are a powerful network of doers, and I'm always so proud of y'all when cool stuff happens. I, you know, the, the the story I keep telling is how one person had their had their double wide knocked off its foundation in a sudden flood, and within two weeks, a crew of people from from our network showed up at her place in Tennessee with 
jacks and whatever else, lifted that thing up, reset the block foundation, and then spent the rest of the day gutting it so that it doesn't mold. Not every community will do stuff like that. And um, the other thing you may not know about our, our community is we're not just homesteaders. We're doctors. We're lawyers. We're website developers. We are phone app makers. We are machinists. We are farmers. We are so many different things. We are teachers. We are school bus drivers. We have a lot of people with a lot of perspectives and their hands in a lot of things throughout the network. And the one thing we have in common is we believe that the individual should be empowered to make their own decisions. That's one thing. I guess we have more than one thing in common. And we're a network of doers. We don't really have a lot of patience for takers. Every so often we get a taker in here and they just sort of stop being interested in interacting because we expect them to do if they're going to be in this network. Well, during the pandemic, by the way, we have reporters, all sorts of stuff. During the pandemic uh, that has been going on, it has been increasingly difficult to understand what information one can believe or should believe in order to just make the best logic-based decision for actions you want to take. We can all see the propaganda pa campaign going on. We can see the spin. We can, we can even feel anxiety from how society appears to be losing their minds. I've, I've talked to, in the last two weeks, is why I did last Monday's episode, I've talked to a lot of people who are afraid. I've talked to a lot of people who feel like they live in an alternate reality from what everybody else in the world is doing. That's not really, and I understand that. As I look around, I would posit that most people live in the alternate reality that you and I live in. We just aren't talking to each other. And it's time to start talking to each other. And it's time to start standing with each other. One of the cool things about our network is we have doctors and nurses in all walks of the medical field. It's, it's surprising to me. Like I didn't realize how big the Living Free in Tennessee network was until about the last three months as people, more and more people have been sending me email. And, and I realized that it goes beyond just, you know, these cute people who like to can things in their kitchen and do stuff with their hands, right? It's, it's a very powerful network. Well, if we can tap into doctors and nurses and ask them questions, we are getting more direct information than if we believe an NBC News anchor, right, about what's going on. And one of the people from our network who, one of the reasons I like interacting with her is that we don't agree on things and we can talk about it. And nobody gets feelings hurt. And I love that because she also will just say what she thinks. And she's not, you know, scared of Nicole Sauce, who has a different opinion. Um, but she's been working, giving care to COVID patients since early 2020. She's been a nurse to the hardest cases, Right. The, the kind of COVID you don't want to get where you end up on a vent, those kind of cases. And um, over the weekend, she shared something on social networks that was about the, the six st phases of severe COVID. These are the people she's been helping. And I remember probably six months into the whole thing in 2020, her writing about how she wasn't allowed to take a day off. And how exhausted she was. I think since that time, they have started allowing medical prof professionals to take a day off from time to time, which is necessary for their own recovery so they can stay strong, right? But she's also, you know, for those of us who believe in individual choice on our side, I believe, I don't know for sure, she doesn't say it here, but I haven't seen her pushing for draconian measures in this, in this whole thing ever. She just wants to see people get through this as best they can so we can put it behind us. And so she shared this thing saying, this is what I've been facing for, you know, 
18 months now. Maybe, I guess it's more than 18 months at this point, but this is what I've been facing every day at work. And I'm going to read to you what she has to say because for me, her perspective is really helpful for me to make my own decisions. And some of the recent decisions I have reaffirmed with myself, um, I'm motivated when I see this to, to really stay the path because I've been a little wobbly on some, some personal decisions I made and I can't afford to be wobbly. So this is what she said. So she shared this thing about what it's like, what severe, what the severe, the progress of the severe disease is. And she said, this is reality to me. I'm not debating vaccine versus non-vaccination here. So just don't. And, and I know where she's coming from on this. If she ever talks about that topic, I've seen what happens on her page. People like go at each other's throats. I see both vaccinated and unvaccinated on the vents and dying. So the whole, you think you're safe just because you're vaccinated is a farce. It may help keep you in the lower severity category, but once on the vent, it all ends up pretty much the same. I wish I had answers to make this horrific nightmare stop. Eventually, this will be endemic and not pandemic. Eventually, we'll be back in the driver's seat and not at the mercy at a 0.3% mortality rate virus. We still have 400,000 to die in this country before we've met our 0.3%. I think Delta is going to get us to that number a little faster. There isn't room for anything else in the hospitals. It's pretty much all COVID or clot and strokes due to COVID and vaccinated patients. It's getting everyone, folks, this, this causes blood clots, so act accordingly. We are back to canceling elective surgeries. We need our health care providers everywhere, elsewhere right now. I won't go into how tired we are and how much demand is being placed on us to fill gaps. I harp on that enough. When people call about their loved ones on the phone, they don't get it. They don't understand why their wife isn't answering her phone anymore. Or their college-age son isn't texting his best friend anymore. They don't understand. They are sedated and paralyzed and intubated. That means they can't talk, they can't move on their own, they can't do anything without our assistance, and they hopefully feel no pain and aren't aware of what's going on around them too much because it's quiet. No real human interaction. We don't know what they hear, so we talk to them when we give them a bath and turn them. I play music for them. I wish families were allowed to see them and sit with them. My humanity side says maybe more would make it if they weren't in isolation. Maybe it would help them cope seeing the progression instead of the phone call from a doctor saying it's time to make a decision. Most families think they have time while they're on the vent. You don't. They are so fragile. A good turn and fluid shift could change everything. Then when they need ECMO, sorry, we're only taking patients under 40 and there's a waiting list. Most by this time cannot wait, so they die. They, in some cases, will not be put on a vent if they're over 80. Bad outcomes and young people need the vents, so they're having to prioritize care on those that have the best ability to survive. My God, I never thought this could happen here. It tears the docs up because they have to call or tell family we have no vent for grandma. Chronic conditions are prioritized to down the list. It's all about survivability, not who's in front of you. Oh, and who's in front of you. Don't get sick. It's a terrible time to be sick. Get your checkups. Get your labs done. Talk to your general practitioner like like you should eat and drink well. Drink water. Start an exercise regimen. Stop smoking or drinking alcohol. Do this now. That way, if you get a sniffle, you can self-treat before you need the ER for sepsis or pneumonia. Help us help you, please. There is no more room. In her comments, she also went on to talk about some vitamins to take to help boost your immune system. When I read this, it's very emotional and I can understand why it would be just being, seeing people day after day who are so sick. Um, I think a lot of times when we're talking about this, because it doesn't make most people sick, right? We don't remember that some people are getting really sick and that is hard to watch day after day. And we can make our own personal choices right now to reduce, to further reduce any chances that when slash if we get this, and we're probably all going to get it guys at some point, if we haven't had it already, um, our bodies fight it off. Now I am pleased to have known 
only one person who's died from this. And I am pleased to have known only one person that's died from the vaccine. That, that's where the numbers are for me right now. And almost everybody I know who got this either got really sick and recovered. One other one ended up in the hospital. Two other ones have ended up in the hospital that I know of. And everybody, and then most of them said they felt achy and they didn't feel good for, you know, anywhere from three days to two weeks, but they're fine. That's the context. But if you're looking at, like, you're one of those people who hasn't had it yet, and you're staring down the wrong end of a drinking problem, or an obesity problem, a lifestyle-related illness, or you're not getting your walks in, because life's hard, hey, guys, I get it. I had a really bad August in that regard. But now would be a good time to slow down a little bit and to prioritize your health. Now when hospitals actually are running out of staff to, to take care of people who end up there, now is a really good time to go on that morning walk every day or that afternoon walk. It's a great time to cut out sugar. It's a great time to cut out alcohol for a while. It's a great time to start addressing the smoking thing. And I know that's hard. Um, but I wanted to read this because it's a perspective from somebody in our network. It's a perspective from somebody treating these patients. And her perspective isn't go take this miracle drug or go get this shot or anything other than address your core underlying lifestyle issues so that you can fight this when you get it. So I don't have to see you. And I thought... That's a perspective we never hear about in the news, isn't it? Interesting, huh? So I hope I hope that was something that you were ready to hear if you needed to hear it. Before we jump into the interview today, I do want to talk about some of our normal Monday segments. Woohoo! Yeah, so I didn't do the Monday show because it was Labor Day. But I wanted to give you an update. Tales from the Prepper Pantry. This is where we talk about storing what we eat and eating what we store, and the freeze dryer is back up and running right now. I've got a batch with a couple of soups, and I something Chris dropped off that I can't remember what it was, but they all seemed to be similar flavor profiles, so if there's any cross-contamination in flavors, they'll all be good. Um, so that's going, and those are going to package into individual meals that you can just add water to. Um and it's it's a full meal. And we've now had Hiker Mama Sauce out testing some of these meals. And she said they are lighter than anything she usually carries because most of her meals are self-made made and uh, dehydrated in a like an Excalibur style dehydrator. And that means she can carry more calories for less weight. And she said, once I rehydrated it, it tastes the way I remember it tasting when I made it. And then she followed that up quickly with, that might be hiker stomach speaking, though. <laughs> so if you don't know what hiker stomach is, go out on a couple day overnights hike. And um, by day three, you're like, everything tastes good. If, in fact, if you want to get over your distaste of how a food tastes, bring that food with you as one of the things. And you may end up liking it by the end of your hike because you start getting pretty hungry when you're expending that many calories day after day. The other thing going on is with the green chili delay, I was all set to make salsa with those this weekend, which means I have tomatoes and peppers and onions and cilantro ready to go for ingredients and garlic and no hatch green chilies. So what I've done in order to get through this, and this is I wanted to share this with you so you know you know how that looks when things don't always go right, I'm going to use my freezer. So everything is chopped up and in the freezer in salsa batch sizes. And what I'll be able to do when we're making salsa is, is pull out a salsa batch size, add the appropriate amount of roasted hatch green chilies, and then cook that and can it, and we'll have salsa. So those are the two things going on 
in the prepper pantry right now, besides the fact that we had to take the whole thing apart last weekend because we were working a jackhammer on that side of the house and didn't want to break jars. And I just got that put back together so that I can get ready for Hatch Green Chili Weekend. With that, it's time for the main content of today's show, Back to the Land, with Matt Hundley. Matt Hundley is a permaculture farmer, homestead designer, and musician in Middle Tennessee who hails from my home state of Oregon. In fact, as he was speaking regionally in this interview, I was a little surprised to learn that, you know, where he talks about his stomping grounds are. They're they're not right in, but they're not far from where my family's from. And so we had a lot of shared perspectives on Oregon. You'll hear about those in the show. They are doing a Back to the Land Festival in October, and he came on to talk about that and self-reliance in general and how to build that into your life. So with that, I want to say, hey, Matt, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to have you on, and I I know a lot of my listeners may not know who what a Matt Hundley is. So <laughs> let's go back to when you were first thinking about what you wanted to be when you grow up. How did you go from, you know wanting to be a veterinarian or whatever you wanted when you were a kid to what you're doing now with homesteading. Mm -hmm. I I think it was like a lot of people. It it slowly just started to make more sense in my life. Um, I did kind of grow up in the lifestyle. I'm from Oregon originally. And we, you know, we had the five acres. We loosely homestead, but we had the chickens and did a lot of hunting and fishing and some foraging. Um, And so I did have a background in it. And most of my early jobs as a child was working on small farms and organic farms. Um, So I had a really good start in that regard. But to me, it never seemed like a practical way of life. The movement hadn't really taken off the way it has now. And it didn't really seem achievable because I lived in Oregon. And um, the way that state is structured has made buying land, land, exactly. It's made land ownership so unfeasible for anybody who is on a budget, who's not working in the tech industry or anything like that. So it just seemed like, and, and, you know, living inside that state, I didn't realize the broader context that not everywhere was like that. I didn't know about, you know, red state versus blue state. I didn't know any of that. And so it just, I kind of wrote it off in the beginning and it it kind of hurt because I always wanted that lifestyle. Even as a child, I wanted to just create on a piece of land. I wanted to express myself. I wanted to, I, I didn't even of course know what permaculture was or any of that, but I, I wanted to build a system with nothing. I I had that kind of innate, but it wasn't really an option. So I actually went down the music route and became a a full-time musician, traveled the country doing that. And that's what brought me to Tennessee, where all of a sudden I started looking around and thinking, well, gee, there's $5,000 lots over here. (laughs) This this is actually possible for for a person on a musician's salary. Um, And so it was a couple of years ago, kind of by default, I found a property that I could beg, borrow, and steal enough to buy. It was an old meth lab on an acre, a decrepit, <laughs> horrible, just as bad as you can imagine, piled with just bags of trash and human feces and syringes, just the most nightmare scenario. Um, but I, I slowly cleaned it up over, over the course of the year, and I planted food in the one spot that wasn't contaminated. And uh, as they say, the rest is history. You know, it just, uh, it clicks for me, and it became a way of life that was just inseparable from who I am. And I could never, ever, ever go back into the city. I could never leave the journey of self-sufficiency and homesteading. You know, it's really funny because I talk about that, that I can't go back to the city thing. Like if I have to, when I'm elderly, I may end up back in an apartment if I haven't figured out a strong enough community to be able to stay here. Mm -hmm. But like the thought of all the lights and the noise Mm -hmm. and people all up in your face, to me, after living this way for 14 years, I can't even start. <laughs> You've been free range too long. Yeah. I'm like, wait, what do you, how do you guys sleep at night? I don't get yeah. it. <laughs> it's funny because for me, that was only like two short years ago that I was in an apartment and, you know, worrying about getting stabbed on the way to the parking lot. And it just seems like a lifetime ago. And at this point, I think I would rather just die than, than go back to that way of living. So would you say it was worth all the effort of cleaning up the mess you had? I had a big mess here when I started. Uh, Yeah, so much. And and it was also life changing that I realized kind of my own capabilities and what I could do and what I could achieve. One of the things I wish I could change about people's perception in Oregon of land use planning and zoning Mm -hmm. is that the protecting of farms is not what's happening. 
not at all. All they're doing is protecting the developers. They're only keeping mom and pops from building a, a place for their kid or somebody from yeah. building mother-in-law quarters. Yeah, that was my experience. The development goes unchecked. The gobbling up of farmland is at, at an accelerated rate from what I see here in Tennessee. Yeah. Yeah, totally. It's totally. And then they don't get it. They think, oh, no, we're protecting farmers. It's like, no, you're not. You're pushing. I I understand, though. I do understand the like, I don't want to see urban development and sprawl gobble for everything. But, you know, I mean, this might be jumping the gun on topics, but permaculture is the answer for that. We can spread humans all over the landscape. We're supposed to live in nature. We're supposed to be there. It's okay for us to be in nature and to build houses. We just have to do it right. Well, since you brought up permaculture, we might as well talk about it. How did you discover permaculture and why did it resonate with you? Yeah. Um, so growing up in Oregon, you know, Oregon does have that for all of its negatives. It does have the a lot of the back to the land hippies came up there from San Francisco in the 60s. And a lot of yeah. folks, the, the, the early adopters of organic farming and such, they, they moved to Oregon, especially the Willamette Valley in that area where I'm from. So I was very lucky to be already surrounded by people who were pursuing different versions of more sustainable agriculture, you know, not permaculture per se. Um, But we had the organic farmers. We had the old guys from the 60s who um, were, you know, growing as regeneratively as they could alongside their illicit marijuana grows and everything back in the day. (laughs) No, Uh, not there. (laughs) Not Oregon. Also not Tennessee. Yeah, yeah, definitely not. Not occurring here. (laughs) Um, (laughs) But... There, of course, permaculture wasn't really a word that had reached anywhere in the dichotomy like it has now. Um, of course, it was happening in Australia and, and all around the world, but it certainly had not reached my ears. Um, but really, a, a lot of people were already kind of practicing it. Oregon is a lot of small farmers, a lot of families who've been there for a long time. It was settled so late in the game that it's mm-hmm. very different than other parts of the U.S. There was a lot of groups that came from random places. There's, I grew up near some uh, a lot of Dutch settlers. Yeah. Um, and there was some Russian Orthodox, you know, very different people groups who were kind of like the Amish in that they're very um, kind of like in their own little community. And as a result, they're multi-generational farms. And so there's already a lot more land use planning going on and mm-hmm. or not land use planning, but a lot of more planning of carefully using the land for generations, yeah. better yeah. soil health. Not and government of planning of land, in other words. Mm-hmm, exactly. And then just the nature of the soil there and the climate is that there's tons of agroforestry tons of um, uh, orchards and berries and all of that. So a lot of those things were already kind of in there. There was just no holistic philosophy behind it. Um, And so I already had grown up kind of with that mindset. And then I think I came across the the concept really only a few years ago, as many people do just on the internet and and in a start to see in books like Ruth Stout's book, even though that wasn't technically called permaculture, it was the introduction of some of those ideas of how to actually regenerate soil and such. Mm -hmm. Um, And it made so much sense. I was like, well, this is kind of what my family was doing for generations before this, because we didn't have chemical fertilizers. We didn't have any option except to treat the land well, or else we would be living in the mess that we had created. And it also fit within the framework of poverty because everything I've done homesteading wise has been with no money. I'm a musician for a living. Most of my life I've made around $200 a week. That's been my income. Mm-hmm. And so there really weren't a lot of options other than using the margins and using all of these permaculture principles and techniques, which don't require big giant draconian solutions, but rather slow and small and affordable ones. Yeah. And I, it also appealed to me that there was a system that really for other reasons, it wanted to use no inputs or less inputs. And so to build a system that self contained really made sense to me. It, like, why wouldn't we build farms like, I don't like doing math. So if I want to, if I have to sit down and figure out the profitability of my farm, boy, it's a lot easier to do that math. If I don't have to think what the prof, what the uh, expenses were, if I can just say, well, gee, everything that comes off of here is profit because it's a self-contained system. Yeah. Um, or I'm using Except waste. For your labor, your labor is not. Labor, that's, yeah, that's expense. <laughs> but heck, I'll be working dawn till dusk anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I, I came across the wording and then uh, of course I got on the YouTube binge and just immersed myself and, um, when the lockdowns first started, started occurring, um, my industry was, was quickly shut down um, yes, it was. by armed police, which was a very dystopian uh, thing to witness, but that did give me this year and a winter where I, I, I decided to really invest my time into truly understanding and learning this system. Um, so I first immersed, immersed myself in the formal learning and I took the, the course, um, 
that Tagari Institutes puts out with Bill Mollison. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then I just delved into the books, delved into the videos. I started working on a, on organic slash permaculture farm, um, which was actually a saving grace for me financially. So that was wonderful to be able to jump right into working on a working farm and learning in person um, and also just getting a lot of plants and cuttings from them um, and seeing what to do, what not to do. Um, and since then, it's just been 24 seven learning. I'm, I'm obsessed with it. It's, it's an addiction that <laughs> once you get started down this road, you just you can't turn it off. Yeah, it's hard not to look at things and think with the permaculture eye. It's funny because mm-hmm. I I was I was in Portland, Oregon before I was here, and uh, Toby Hemingway had influence in Portland about like planting plant communities in your yard. I had like a postage stamp city lot that mm-hmm. I learned about plant communities from a neighbor, and it wasn't until like full circle a decade later I discovered permaculture. I realized that. I had a resource there. I totally didn't see. Mm-hmm. Into That's what's funny is, is you see all those spots where it was already being practiced or you were accidentally starting to practice it and yeah. you just didn't have the framework or the context. I spent five or six years here trying to invent permaculture. Mm-hmm. I was like, <laughs> I swear on a homestead, monitored homesteading, one thing should feed another and it should all be in balance and I should make mm-hmm. this easy so I can have a career, you know, like all of those things. And then I heard about permaculture. I was like, oh, Okay. Somebody else. Somebody I thought else I was a genius. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Never mind. I'll just learn what they did. <laughs> so, um, have you found just because we have a similar background in geographical location, the things that worked in Oregon do not work in Tennessee at all. Have you had any fun experiences with that? Uh, of course, specific plant things. Some of them make me very sad because Oregon for for all of the negatives is truly Narnia. It's paradise. Yeah. Um, like there's a reason my ancestors went there at any cost, like the soil and the, the mildness of the climate makes growing just a dream. Farming is just a dream. So there's specific plants like rhubarb that I really struggle to get to do well here. And they're just, of course, all the best plants in the world. Um, yeah. Of course, there's tons of trade-offs. There's tons of things that do wonderfully here that don't do well in Oregon. But I would say the thing, the single biggest thing I, I miss is the lack of insect problems. Not that there are no <laughs> problems, but there are no ticks. You're not going to walk outside and get Lyme disease in an hour. Like yeah. it, it's just like such a friendlier <laughs> environment. It's still, it's just as lush or more so than Tennessee, but just does not have the same mean insects that are all trying to kill you. Yeah. And your plants. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, of course. Yeah. They're not just gobbling up everything in their path, like a swarm of locusts. <laughs> yeah, I came here all hippie and I'm like, companion planting is all you need to do. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, wait, I am literally out here every morning picking stupid bugs off stupid plants mm-hmm. and throwing them in a in a thing of rubbing alcohol. And My philosophy not- has now become, except for like hornworms and things that yeah. will just decimate your tomatoes is like, you know what, if I have to spend time doing something, I'm just going to spend time making more beds and planting more and let the bugs have some. Yeah, I got there too. I spent years like trying to get things to grow here that I just don't grow very well. Hornworms, I've gotten to the point where I'm almost completely imbalanced. Like my hornworm infestation just happened last week here. And I removed two hornworms and the rest of them have all the wasp eggs on them. Oh, good. And, I've, and, and I've just been like, every time I see one of those little wasp egg, I'm like, you're all right. You just stay mm-hmm. right there. Yeah, and and I don't, yeah. So that's been a big, that has, it took me three or four years to get that in balance. Yeah. And I have faith that I'll get there. Um, I, at this new site we're on, I've been spreading um, the tomatoes out all over the property as well. So yeah. that helps just having them in, in every little patch. You know, if one is getting an infestation, the other is not. Yeah, the the thing I noticed the the core pro- difference in Oregon here is growing is you just grow there. Yeah. And here it's like you go to growing war mm. against weeds and insects and eventually you can get a balance but it's not just like hey, I'll throw some stuff out in the yard and a couple of weeds yeah. might come up, but whatever. That was Oregon. It's true like, like a tomato pickle. blight, what's that? <laughs> Yeah, people don't understand unless they've gardened there just how absurdly easy it is. I didn't realize you had to like prepare soil and do things because yeah, truly, yeah. we live so far out too in uh, what used to be you know old growth forest. So the yeah. soil just millennia of that plus all that glacial soil that got pushed down from Canada in the last ice age or flood or whatever happened there. And it's like I don't even know how deep that black topsoil goes, but oh my gosh, I, I actually I just saw the other day a place selling topsoil. Very yeah. expensive bags of topsoil. It's just soil they literally dig up from Oregon. <laughs> That's all it is. <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Meanwhile, we're like, I'm going to run some rabbits through here and then some wood mm-hmm. chips and then some more rabbits. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> That's funny. Okay. So you come from Oregon and self-sufficiency in Oregon is not that big a deal. No, it's not. Why do you think it's important? And how did that come to be that you, you mean like you were influenced very differently there? Yeah. Um, of course I kind of like the homesteading that was always in the back of my head. Um, I grew up on the living in the woods, basically. We, we actually kind of backed up to the Tillamook state forest. So I had a half million acre backyard. So from, yeah. from the moment I could walk, I was walking into a state forest and we just had full license to just roam. It was a wonderful way to grow up. And so survivalism is, it was more my intro. Um, I think kind of that's sort of like people like Jack Spirico and stuff like that. It was kind of how, you know, they, they got in with first survivalism. Because yeah. that, that, it's just something that I think innately resonates with people like us is some kind, anything that draws us closer to a more natural existence appeals to us. So survivalism and, and just surviving in the woods and, you know, the, I wasn't a Boy Scout, but that Boy Scout kind of stuff. Um, yeah. That was like my first foray into it. But of course, it was a long time before I would realize like, well, wait, shouldn't I be surviving all the time? <laughs> Not just if I get lost. Um, yeah. So that, exactly. that's how you know, but that starts to get you your toe in the water with foraging and um, hunting and fishing. And, but like, of course that doesn't really bring the farming or anything like that in. Um, but I was always interested, always reading about it, but it didn't become a priority in my lifestyle until again, the lockdowns, because um, I got to see firsthand how they were enforcing um, all of this tyrannical response, everything from the masks to pushing the, uh, the shot. And I realized that, well, so far there was very little violent enforcement. There was some, they closed down the bars with police with guns for sure. But yeah. most of it was coercion saying, we're going to, you can't work. You can't do your job. You can't go to the grocery store. You can't go to the gas station. You can't get the things you need unless you obey us. And while the, the mask thing was relatively innocuous, like it's not going to kill you. Um, right. I, I saw that as this is a good indicator of where things are going. Obviously this is going to go towards a, a passport and towards forced medical interventions. And then who knows where else we're going to go from there, whether that's chips or, you know, whatever, wherever it goes, they're going to extract your compliance with your dependence on the system. And mm-hmm. so right away, I mean, day one, I saw the pattern here. I saw where we were going and it scared me crapless. And <laughs> I, I mean, like that day, the day they closed down the bars, I started planting food and we yeah. got our garden going and we started just running, sprinting from the system. And uh, myself and my fiance, Gabby, we have been sprinting away as fast as we can ever since. And I see there's no end goal for us. We don't, we're not like, okay, we want to reach like just food self-sufficiency. We want to run as fast and as far from the system as we can, as quickly as we can get mm-hmm. away from it. Mm-hmm. That's cool. Um, so you started motivated by fear but Mm -hmm. you don't seem motivated by fear now. When did that change and why did that change? It it just now, I think this, I think this would happen to anybody that pursues this lifestyle, no matter what your starting motivation is, you're going to fall in love with it. Like it, it, if you can get past day one and you don't hate it, you're going to fall in love with it. (laughs) I I really think uh, our, our pro, a lot of our problems in society, society ranging from our addictions, like everything from people who are addicted to gambling Mm -hmm. or addicted to substances, all of that is, I think, mimicking what should actually naturally be happening. Because you know what it's like when you're out in the garden and you're looking for potatoes and you find some potatoes, it triggers that dopamine release in your brain. You get that little bit of excitement. You get yeah. the little disappointments, just like you get in gambling with a slot machine. You get the little disappointments or like you get from social media, you know, and then suddenly you see you got likes on your post and that releases the dopamine in your brain. And so gardening and farming and self-sufficiency does all of those things, hunting, fishing, all of it. Yeah. It does all of those things to your brain. There's a reason your brain is wired that way. We're addicted to, we have so many problems and addictions because our brains are not existing the way they're supposed to. They should be living like that. They should be, we should be living a self-sufficient life that involves way more hunting and gathering and farming. And it's the lack of that that makes our lives so miserable and unnatural. And so as soon as you step back into this lifestyle, you, you, you just feel your mentality improving. You feel it's almost like a fog lifts from your brain. It's like a veil drops off. You feel like you're in some kind of weird matrix or something. And so I, I think I've never seen anybody turn away from this lifestyle ever. <laughs> it seems like as soon as you get in, you're trapped. Yeah. You're, you're going to love self-sufficiency and keep pursuing it. And of course, there's all the practical. Like my health is so drastically improved. My yeah. mind has improved. My creativity and 
Um, of course, I've been so busy lately, I haven't had much time for that. But as a musician, like I, I quit writing songs to appease and to try to get rich and famous. And I just started focusing on truly what I thought I was meant to create. So everything from my artistic expression to my health, to just my happiness, everything. It's just all so much, my spirituality, everything has completely changed. So yeah, I think once your foot is in the door with self-sufficiency, you just can't stop. I, You know, the people I know who fail at this when they go in or end up miserable, um, they start it from a place of fear. They way over commit and what they're doing isn't supporting a long-term life goal. Yeah, And, and so, cause I have seen people back, back out and they just end up complete like pools of mush from all the work they're doing. They're not mm-hmm. getting benefit from it. They have because they don't prioritize. Yes. And, and then they end up really disappointed because the dream of what homesteading was like is different than the reality. And, and the, mm-hmm. that is true. Like we see all these beautiful YouTube channels of people homesteading mm-hmm. and there's a lot of great stuff about it. But sometimes you do walk out and the dog ate the face off your goat or something horrible (laughs) can happen. And part of homesteading is learning how to work through those things, too, which I know, like, I'm a big animal lover. That part was hard for me at first. Like, my first, I'm glad I started with chickens because chickens are jerks to each other. Yes. (laughs) And so they go from this cute little puffy thing to assholes. And Mm. then, and then you're like, okay, like, I think I can get over the fact I'm going to need to process you now. Yeah. And I didn't think I could do that. And then once I went through that, I realized also it's in their best interest. If somebody has a problem that requires culling, mm-hmm. um, I didn't think I could cull. And then I'm like, yeah. So I let one chicken like go beyond and tried to save it and saw how much pain it was in. And I was like, okay, now I understand culling a lot better. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that's, and that's another benefit is that it, I think it draws you into reality more. Yeah. And, and that's why I think like, if you're going to eat meat, you should have to kill the animal for sure. Because First of all, you see the cost and, and then it, all of the debates around that kind of become irrelevant when when you raise your own animals. But it, it changes you as a person. It strengthens you so much to yeah. have to deal with all of that. Like you said, you know, you walk out and you see half your flock dead or something and just like it's so crushing and so disappointing. But then like you learn what you're capable of dealing with. Yeah. And it prepares you for when grandma dies or, you know, when the other tragedies of life that happen to everybody happen, you're way more prepared for it. Yeah, it's funny. It is funny. I think the other thing. So that death issue. I do. I think, I don't know if you follow me much, but I do chicken processing workshops mm-hmm. and um, the majority of my participants in the last workshop were women. I had one male participant. Oh, wow. And, and I started it out and they were all, they'd never done anything like this before. And I just started out by saying, here's the deal. We're going to teach you how to process a chicken from beginning to end. We honor life here. We're going to teach you how to dispatch this chicken as painlessly as possible. And if you decide you can't do it, nobody's going to judge you. We'll do it for you. And we'll teach you the rest of the process. Um, And the two of them came up and said they took the class because they didn't know if they could handle it. And the way we approach showing them how to dispatch it from more of an emotional standpoint and less of a just this is the mechanics of it. She said that really helped them do that thing and now they know they can do it they know they can raise their chickens and not end up with you know 25 big white fat pets that, yeah <laughs> you know that die that, whose hearts explode because they're not built for that mm-hmm. yeah so i think i think there are ways to uh, like face down some of those fears if you're interested in homesteading but not Absolutely. sure you can do it yeah, and, and that's almost the point, really, is, yeah. is that stretching, growing experience as a person, with it, learning to do the things you could never yeah. do. And Absolutely. then you may decide, you know what, processing chickens isn't for me, and you outsource that part. Yeah, you might be like, boy, I guess I like eggs a lot more than I realized. <laughs> <laughs> and it does really, like, you really do rethink your protein sources when you are responsible for them. You're like, yeah. oh, okay, I think I will eat more vegetables. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, I don't know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty carnivore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me too, me too. But like when you really have to put in the work, it certainly puts it into perspective. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I ended up discovering a strange love of butchery. Like mm-hmm. I don't, I haven't ever really tried hunting. Dispatching the animals not my favorite part, but I can. But I am friends with guys who hunt, mm-hmm. and we have this deal. I have an outside fridge. You get a deer, you can just without calling, you can come over and throw it in my fridge and come back for a share of the meat. I'll cut it up and package it for you and make whatever sausage or whatever. 
Heck, I'm bringing mine over. That's a great deal. <laughs> yeah, it is. I, and I, because I like that part better than I like the thought of, I know for some people it's peaceful to sit in a tree stand or whatever y'all do out there. Mm-hmm. I'll be like, I've been alone with my head too much. I'm yeah. Not moving. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I probably need to address that at that problem, but, <laughs> but yeah, certainly the processing, it's like, it can be like kind of a meditative activity too. I get that. It's, it's pretty yeah. satisfying to start with a, a whole giant animal and then yeah. end up with like, you know, stuff neatly wrapped in the, in the paper. And it's like, I did that. Yeah. Well, no, no, I have a chamber vac packer now. It's all vacuum packed and yeah, I love it. I love it. Okay. So let's transition to community because self-sufficiency sounds like loneliness to a lot of people, but you like to pair community with self-sufficiency. So why do you think community, like what is the role of community and self-sufficiency? Yeah, that's, this is like the thing I believe most strongly that we are doing wrong as a community. Um, yeah. And we're not addressing this question because I know a lot of people there. Are, I see this a lot in YouTube comments and, and social media comments. People saying like, what well, are you going to be a lone wolf, you know, up in the woods, you're not going to survive. And, and they're kind of right. Um, <laughs> we, we have to first kind of define you like, what are we even talking about when we self say self-sufficiency? Um, because very, very few of us are truly getting 100% of our substance and our health care and everything we need and our energy um, completely exclusively by ourselves. There's been some cool people experimenting in that space, like Rob Greenfield, who, you know, went a year um, solely yeah. on what he could forage and grow. Um, <clears throat> but that's actually not necessarily a natural state of existence. For, I think, most of us, when we talk about self-sufficiency, we're talking about being self-sufficient from the larger system, from the industrial system, from chemical agriculture, from government, from big hospital institutions and corporations. We're, we're talking about yes, relying more on ourselves, but also just anything that gets us away from that system. Mm-hmm. Uh, so first of all, kind of redefining that way, it's self-sufficiency, be, and also realizing that most of us are just pursu- pursuing somewhere on the spectrum of self-sufficiency. We're just trying to get closer. We're not trying to turn off the switch tomorrow and just have everything under our control. You know, we're trying to get closer, but it's not an unreasonable expectation. So first of all, like, I think that helps the discussion is to just look at like, what are we really trying to pr- achieve here self-sufficiency wise? But when we really look back at history at mostly self-sufficient communities, which pretty much everything was um, in the past, everything was in small groups. You weren't going to Walmart to get your goods. You realize that if you read any kind of book, little house on the prairie or anything that's written during a self-sufficient period of time, there was no self-sufficiency. It was all about reliance on your community. Of course you wanted to have your own homestead be as strong as possible and not need help as much um, so that it was more of a rare thing, but nobody built their barn by themselves. Everybody, the, your neighbors, it was expected that you would help your neighbors build their barn in their house and vice versa. And when one crop failed, they would bring another crop over and there was an exchange of seedlings and, and, uh, you know, from beginning to end neighbors and communities have cared for each other. That's what, that's what self-sufficiency is. It's not truly self. You're not alone living in a shack. Um, cause if, if you were just taking the word self-sufficiency, that would say you don't even have a family. It's just self. You just only me, lie by myself. myself with my yeah. Dad. And that, that's pretty, that's pretty absurd. Really. <laughs> no, <laughs> virtually nobody is trying to do that. And if you are, you know, props, that sounds Fine. like a fun that's journey to follow, you. but yeah. I'm not going to do that. I don't, I don't have any desire to, because that's also a system that's set up for failure. You want resilience and you want fallback plans, but this was very much, uh, this really illuminated itself to me um, at the beginning of the lockdowns again. Uh, we went out and we had got, just gotten on the property and we went out and we bought chickens and rabbits and we were very concerned about the food supply, you know, not, mm-hmm. we weren't sure how far the tyranny and the collapse and lockdowns would go. We really just had, this was like back in January, February. So before the mainstream was really um, aware of it, we were watching what was going to happen. We could see the government agencies positioning themselves to for these takeovers and everything so we we but we just we were expecting actually total complete we thought we we're going to jump right to 1933 we thought yeah. it was going to be full-on fascism rather than this gradual slide into it yeah and and we thought collapse would occur right away too so thank god it did not um so we yeah. definitely panic bought our animals so we got chickens and rabbits and yeah. uh built a coop and i, I keep going uh, we built a coop and um, I used chicken wire. You know, I grew up with chickens in Oregon and everything. So I was like, chicken wire is called chicken wire for a reason. That's what you're supposed to build chicken coops out of. <laughs> well, a no. pack of wild dogs came through and chewed right through the chicken wire. Yep. Decimated our entire flock the day after we had built the coop. 
Oh, um, so every chicken died, every rabbit died, right in a time when we were worried about survival and whether there would be food or not, or whether we could access mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. And it was just devastating to walk out that morning and see that. But the first thing that happened was my neighbor came over and he had an armload of beef that, from the cattle he had raised. He works on a, a cattle farm. Oh, nice. And <clears throat> it was at that moment that just clicked, it, that made it click in my brain like, oh, this is what self sufficiency is. It's community, yeah. it's neighbors caring for each other. And since then, you know, I realized that and I started to act accordingly. I started giving out seedlings and seeds to my neighbors. To yeah. Every single neighbor on every single side of me was growing food that I'd given them. They all got gardens going. We were exchanging plants. My cucumbers failed, but my radishes did well. So they gave us cucumbers. I gave them radishes. Um, we ended up all joining the fire department that um, he was running and just, you know, entered in such a better dynamic relationship with our community. And that's been more life changing than the homesteading journey, honestly. Um, and, it, and it's been an integral part of it. And so since then, that's been my mission in the homesteading space and with like the content I'm making, because I think it's, it's not receiving the attention it needs because we are not going to pull this off, especially in a time of tyranny. Um, if we are isolated little homesteads, we will not stand, we will not survive. We saw like out in Oregon, um, if you've been out there, you might know a little bit about like the, uh, the Bundy situation yeah. and the standoff. And you saw there that like alone, they would have absolutely been burned off their ranch and, and the feds would have killed all of the cattle and everything, but they had a community of people that came and rallied behind them. And whether it's that example or just a crop failing or anything, we've always relied as homesteaders on each other. And it's time to start doing that again and actively trying to make these connections and building these communities and rebuild. Cause I also, I watched what happened when a community dies in Oregon. I watched my town die. Um, they, they basically zoned all the businesses out of existence, shut down the post office, shut down the store and the, the school um, agenda 21 was basically first played yeah. out there in Oregon. Yeah. And I watched it happen and it was, it was devastating. And when the gathering spaces went away, the connections between neighbors went away, the lifelong connections, people didn't talk to each other anymore. And it just became a bedroom community where people sleep and then they get up in the morning, they'll go work at Intel and nobody knows each other. They're not there for each other. And it was, it was a horrifying thing to watch and uh, so unnatural and so insidious. And so to me, it's kind of my war too. It's, it's the way I like building connections between people is how we reverse the damage that is being done to us. Yeah, that's why every time we see a Vision 2040 meeting here, mm-hmm. we need to go yeah. and push back on it because Agenda 21, they're trying to do it in Tennessee. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just Oregon. got a new name and fancy new packaging because they've learned mm-hmm. from Oregon and they ruined that state. Oh, like, absolutely. Yeah. Like, new it, it crushes state. me because Oregon is, is it just it has yeah. such a place in my heart and to watch the most beautiful place on earth be taken over and completely destroyed to the point yeah. where... I, I know farmers over there whose operation has been shut down because they had a portable shed on their building on the property um, that they're trying to work out of. So like people need to realize they will shut down farms. They will stop you from being self-sufficient. Oregon is a very good example of that. Yeah. And and then they'll set it up so that the state itself catches on fire. Like little, little oh, yeah, absolutely. policies they, they have resulted in mm-hmm. the scale of the forest fires we're seeing. Oh yeah. And, and I grew up in forest fire country. All of my yeah. ancestors worked for the forestry department. My parents replanted the Tillamook forest by hand. Like we are very intimately aware of forest yeah. fires and there's never been anything like this. And I, I had friends that caught arsonists too. Um, and, and I have a weirdly similar background. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's what I'm realizing. <laughs> like we were soul soulmates somewhere, not, uh, not like in the romantic sense, but just like yeah. friends soulmates somewhere along the way. Somewhere. Never three, met. Three generations ago. <laughs> yeah. I bet. I wonder yeah. if our, because like literally you're in the exact area where my family is from. That's so funny. Yeah. That's so funny. Um, but yeah. Do, I, like, do you know where I, Otis I, is? Otis, Oregon? Otis. Oh, I think I've driven through there. Yeah. You've driven through it on your way to the beach, man. Yeah. That's, that's out there. Is that kind of more by class up? And, uh, yeah. Um, and then yeah. Baird and Newburgh is where my family is all from. Oh yeah. Oh, that is some beautiful country down there. <laughs> I had a lot of Quaker friends there in Newburgh. That's a great, great farming region. My gosh. Yeah, you can grow some plants. Well, it's funny is I live near um, McMinnville, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And McMinnville, uh, McMinnville Oregon's like the nur- nursery capital of Oregon. And McMinnville, Tennessee is the nursery capital of Tennessee. Yeah. So I will call them from my 503 area code number and they'll be like, 
are you trying to reach Oregon? <laughs> That's why they probably get that a lot. <laughs> no, I actually live near you. It's it's ironic. I know. <laughs> okay. Well, yeah. The agenda 21 stuff is, is totally frightening. I, I learned about that before I moved here mm-hmm. and, and saw it very starkly. And I actually got out of Oregon in part because the, intolerance of the culture there had it had changed it was so intolerant i was like this is not a good place to be intolerant yeah, being around intolerant people is bad and in, and until there's a reversal in that it seems to be getting worse day by day to a very yeah like i i grew up for better or worse my mom for some reason always had a lot of books about like the rise of the soviet union and and, yeah. of, and i remember reading these firsthand accounts of both that and Latin American communist uh, dictatorships that arose. And, re- and, I, and I just so distinctly remember reading people as they s- looked around them and in fascist Germany, as they looked around them, they saw these, this totalitarianism nightmare rising and they're just screaming at their neighbors. It's just like, don't you guys see this? No, they <laughs> and, do, and that's the same like thing's Oregon. happening here. Like right now. No, they like don't see time, it. I, I never thought it would happen. I, I, I'm still, every day I wake up just aghast. Like I'm standing in 1917, Soviet Union like I'm watching this happen around me it's mind-boggling but also this is gonna be weird but it's kind of cool to be a witness to history while understanding where it's going like yeah you know you may end up in the camp dude yeah oh no I won't I will I will I might end up dead but I will not be in a camp (laughs) they're gonna try they're gonna try if they get that far yes the camps are already here in Tennessee too yeah so um you know, it's funny. People can't fathom on the community thing because I realized that too early on. Like my property is really good at growing one thing right next door. It's really good at cattle across the street would make a good vegetable garden. Exactly. And and I thought, you know, like, why am I why would I try to battle with raising cattle on a three point two acre homestead? Exactly. With lots of hills and, you know, just no fencing. Not practical. And what I will do is that. trade my my poultry and my chilies or whatever for that. Exactly. <laughs> and that's door. always that's that's what a, an economy is supposed to be. I, I, yeah. I had a discussion with somebody the other day and, were, and as I was talking about self-sufficiency. They said, uh, like, well, what would happen to the economy if everyone was self-sufficient? I was like, well, the economy would be what it is supposed to be. We, we don't have an economy. We have a bastardization and a yeah. redefinition of what an economy is, which is just an, a dependent slave system. Like that's what an economy is. He is going next door and saying, Hey, your cattle, you have cattle and I am really good at growing peppers and I know you like salsa. So let's, let's work something out. Yeah. Our centralized food system works great. As long as there are no disruptions, mm-hmm. it works great. It gets food to hungry people for really cheap. Um, we won't talk about the quality of the food. Let's just talk mm-hmm. functionally here. <laughs> uh, but the minute there's a hurricane, a tornado, a protest or shutdowns from a a pandemic, then you see what happens. Like there's, there's still shortages in the store from shutting down in 2020 Mm -hmm. and people think it's due to something new. That's not, that is from 2020. It still hasn't um, rebounded and become stable. It has not stabilized. And it's because they can't, they can't handle um, one thing going wrong for more than a couple of days and things went wrong for months. Yep. So it's it's kind of funny how that that works, but people can't fathom the idea that somebody would just give of their time to a community for no, no that's, return. And that's that's another thing that I find so interesting is is people think that it's inconsistent that I, as a person who's pretty liberty liberty minded, um, yeah. even an anarchist, that I would be so focused on community. But again, to me, it's inseparable. You cannot no. have anarchy without community. Anarchy is community. Um. There was another kind of instance that really illustrated that to me. Uh, we have a lot of, you know, like anywhere in any rural or city area, we have a lot of meth problems out here. Yeah. And we, we had everybody on our block at our previous location we were at was really good, except for this this one person who um, was making meth. And not that I have any problem with somebody else's, you know, alteration of their consciousness, but they were, you know, having all of the problems that go along with that. They were having really sleazy friends coming over and, knocking yeah. on our doors and there was some child neglect going on, just horrible things happening. And the police of course do absolutely nothing about it. And finally us neighbors got together and we talked to each other. And then we talked to this person and for at least a time he cleaned up his act. The problem was rectified. And it made me realize that that's what anarchy looks like. Yeah. Anarchy is not people running around like how th- that initial picture we have in our minds of anarchy of people running around looting and burning that'll last about a day. 
And then people will look to their neighbors and they'll say, this person is reliable and trustworthy. I'm going to go talk to them. This person is not. We're going to go take care of that person. Anarchy would be a quick phase, the way we picture it, that would be quickly over with. And we would then be in self-sufficient communities, really. Yeah. I mean, with if you if you make the foundation of anarchy, the non-aggression principle, Mm -hmm. that that looting period doesn't compute. Yeah. It well, just I think, completely does not compute. And I understand desperate people will do desperate things, yeah. but. But I think naturally it will flow to, towards that. Anyway, I think the non-aggression is actually what happens naturally. I yeah. think as soon as you remove the big institution of government or whatever the, you know, the king or the warlord is in the area, that power vacuum, I think, is a little bit of a myth because people just don't need any centralized power. I think we've, we've fallen for it for so long. So we do need to teach our kids and, and our communities to never accept violent aggression. But I do think the natural way things go is like, you don't want to go to war with your neighbors because they live right next to you and you don't want to stay up all night. They will get you. <laughs> like, so people very quickly learn to not be aggressive and not, because if you are that neighbor, like imagine being that, that meth head neighbor, mm-hmm. let's say things really did collapse and everybody was just defending their homesteads with AR-15s and there was no police. How long do you think those meth heads would last in that situation? Not very long. And people would realize that their behavior had potentially deadly ramifications if they did not get their act together and treat their neighbors better. So I I really do believe that in anarchy, I think the non-aggression thing is actually inherent and people would figure it out really quickly. Some won't ever. Um, And that's the thing, like (laughs) when people talk about anarchy, like that whole idea, they're like, what about the bad guy? And the question I ask is, what are we doing about the bad guy now? Yeah. right now I'm reading about carjackings and rapes and terrible Mm -hmm. murders and mass shootings and all this other stuff now. And the police simply protect us from rectifying those problems. That's all they do. So they they, they really protect the bad guys. That's all our system does. It enables it. Kind of interesting. Okay. Tell me about Back to the Land Festival because um, yes. I hear that's coming up in October on the, the 14th, mm-hmm. 15th, 16th, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. So this is basically our our way of really just putting our money where our mouth is and saying, let's start building these communities and building community in every aspect of the word. Um, so we, we were looking around and seeing that there are already some great homesteading conferences and places of learning, but um, there were several things we wanted to do different. So one of which was keep it very small. So right from the get go, and also because we're doing this, you know, out of pocket, we decided to just keep it at like, I think we're at 165 tickets is all we're selling. So Mm -hmm. very, very small size, because we kind of want to keep it around that Dunbar number, you know, where you can actually connect with every single person there. Mm -hmm. Um, And we really do want to keep it more localized. There will be people from all over the the country, but um, we really want a lot of Mid-South people to get together and spend a weekend learning intensively and in a very targeted manner since you're um obviously you're going to be a part of this you know like what you're going to be talking on you know like none of this is a random smattering of different topics and stuff like this is all meat and potatoes how do we all learn to get self-sufficient really quickly Mm -hmm. um so bringing people in like billy and william from perm pastors farm and to talk about things like uh real practical butchery he's a butcher expert um uh, 18 day compost topics like building community education uh, practical foraging like these are things that are like really crucial to figuring out and and making a homestead work so we really wanted very practical instruction really fun instruction but really what we feel like is setting us different setting us apart with this is the building of community that's the mm-hmm. most important part of this at the end of the festival everybody's going to sit down and like break into their geographical groups they're going to tra- trade phone numbers. There's going to be a worksheet where they say, here's what I'm trying to accomplish on my homestead. You know, here's what I want to grow. Here's what I want to exchange. Here's what I want to build. I want to do a plant swap in our town. I want to do um, a homeschool co-op. Um, everybody, We're going to talk about all the things that communities can build at the end of this festival. And then we're going to get together and send people home with like action plans and phone numbers. They're going to walk away with like, okay, I know eight people in my county now who want to be truly self-sufficient and are like-minded and value Mm -hmm. everything from self-sufficiency to regeneration of the land and people and independence. And I I think, I think that will be life-changing. And I think that's, that needs to happen on a such broad scale. So we're hoping we can really set an example with the festival and then other people can take from that and copy it and just 
just become the movement in your area. This needs to be a movement and we need to connect the movement. Right now we have a movement of everybody starting to figure out how the heck to homestead and people are getting really serious about it. But now we need to get serious about connecting these homesteads and building allies and friendships. And what we have found is through having a channel, I know not everyone gets to have a YouTube channel, but I'm sure you've found this too. The yeah. connections we've made to people, we've like, you, you meet somebody from the, this, like, I like to joke that I go out and meet random strangers on the internet, like you're supposed to. And I, I meet random people from the, the channel and just instantly become lifelong friends with them. Cause they're mm-hmm. so like-minded you understand them completely and inherently and they understand you. And so I want to bring that experience to people through the festival. Great. And where is it at? Who's going to be speaking? Like, what do you got? What do you got? Yeah, that, it's going to be out here in Hickman County, Tennessee. Um, yeah. We're doing it at a, at a uh, church campground called Nakomi. Uh, we fell in love with Nakomi. Gabby and I were there for a tracking class for the mm-hmm. fire department. And it's an old, I don't know exactly how old, but probably over 100 years old, very old church campground that's been there for a long time. It's very deep in the woods at the bottom of this holler with creeks and lakes and is just visually stunning. You can't even believe how beautiful it is. Um, And we wanted a place like that instead of a fairgrounds or a conference center or something like that. Mm -hmm. And then we kind of wanted to further that vibe with like live music and all that because it's we just wanted to, we wanted to be in a beautiful place and be a beautiful experience. And Nakomi, my gosh, it is it is that. We looked at a lot of locations and that just really stood out. It had cabins and everything. So, yeah, it's at Camp Nakomi on the uh, October fifteenth, sixteenth, seventeenth. Oh, I thought it was fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Fourteen. Okay, yes, thank you. I was about to ask Gabby. She's behind me, and I knew she would get that date right. Yeah, fourteen, fifteenth, and sixteenth. <laughs> yeah, so terrible with dates. Um, and it's, so it's a three day festival slash conference. But we really, know, knowing that a lot of people wouldn't be able to make all three days, we put all of the meat and potatoes, for the most part, on the Saturday. Yeah. So that's the full day when everything really occurs. Um, that's going to be intensive, you know, dawn to dusk learning, lots of workshops, lots of hands-on, lots of speakers. Um, and then Friday, we're doing a farm-to-table potluck and a place where uh, people, kind of a meet and greet where people will get to meet the content creators. We'll have a little bit of, of speaking going on and live music, but mostly Friday is just the connection time, mm-hmm. the uh, building community, meeting people. Um, then Saturday is the meat and potatoes. And then Sunday is a service project. And we're actually going to meet off site at a nearby church. And we're going to plant out a garden there. We're going to do an instant garden slash beds. And we're going to start a community garden that's going to feed the family. Uh, feed the families in the community that are in need and the church will act as the the distribution uh, entity there. And so people will get a hands-on lesson on building instant gardens and Hugo culture and things like that. So there'll be some learning going on, but there'll also be just the, the building of community and the connecting of people and the doing something good, you know? So both that and the Friday event are pretty optional. Um, the Saturday is the most important one. If you, if you had to miss everything, but the Saturday, you would still really walk away with a really valuable experience. I think. Awesome. And how do people like buy tickets? How much are mm-hmm. tickets? What's that yep. look like? Uh, Gabby has done the heavy lifting on that. Uh, they're up at back to the land Um, If you scroll down on the main page, all of the ticket ordering system is right there. Um, it's pretty straightforward and we're, we're pretty available. If people have questions or any hangups or want to buy tickets in cash or Bitcoin or something like that, we'll arrange that as well. Silver, gold, um, whatever. Yeah, exactly. Or, or come give me a massage or something. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, yeah, it's all up there. Back to landfestival.com. Uh, I believe we also have a contact form. So if people have questions, uh, we can, we can answer them there. Uh, we've, we've uh, pushed that ticket price down as low as we could. Uh, we, we didn't have our own farm to host that many people on. Yeah. So. You just and gotta do it. You gotta charge money for stuff. And all that. But uh, uh, I do think that it will, you know, I'm very frugal. So, and so is Gabby. So as we're figuring this out, we, we really believe that, even us being on a limited budget and being very frugal, I think this experience will be life changing enough to, to really justify it. And we did, did keep that push down as far as we can to make it accessible to families. And we offered a different ticket price for kids and everything. So hopefully it's within everybody's price range. Awesome. And if people want to get hold of you or follow your journey, how did they do that? Mm-hmm. So I do uh, a lot of content here on YouTube at sovereign village project. Mm-hmm. Um, that's the name of the YouTube channel. Um, and I also do have the website ups at Sovereign, it's uh, sovereignvillageproject.com. And there's a contact form on there. I'm fairly responsive <laughs> with emails. I'm always struggling to keep up with them, but um, I, I will respond to emails. Uh, and I also have an email address, which is sovereignvillageproject at gmail.com. Um, so, and any festival inquiries can be sent there as well. And I'll definitely get to them. 
Um, and then we also have a publication here on uh, YouTube and uh, on our own website called Finding Country. That's mm-hmm. kind of a newer one we're working on. That's mainly Gabby's domain. And we're really trying to build just a, a good general homesteading publication slash place of connection there um, at findingcountry.com. And we have some video content on uh, YouTube here at Finding Country if you search that. But uh, probably the best one for me right now is Sovereign Village Project. That's where I put the majority of my content and that's the email I'll answer and everything. Awesome. Well, that's that's all helpful for people. And, you know, as you get bigger, it gets harder to answer emails and it takes you like a week every time. I you hate it. That's Gabby, what terrible. that's like. It's so terrible because like <laughs> it's funny because as a musician, like I spent a long time trying to like get famous and all that back yeah. when I was letting my ego run the show. And I realize now that like that's my worst nightmare because I, I hate it when I can't respond to emails and I yeah. start to feel like I'm dropping the ball and no, you and just not, respond to them on your show. You're like, I read that and five mm-hmm. people asked me that question and here's the answer. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's that's my tip because like she'll I, every time she emails me, it takes me a week to answer. Yeah, yeah. I'm, like, I'm, I'm, back, so I'm, I'm bad at it on a good day. It's not just volume. I'm just bad at <laughs> responding to emails. Yeah, it's funny how that works. Well, thanks so much for being on the show. We'll see if uh, I'll be at the, by the way, guys, I'm speaking at the Back to the Land uh, Festival. Oh, yeah, in case anybody missed that part. <laughs> missed that on one of my earlier podcasts. Um, yeah, so I'll be there Saturday talking about um, just how pantry management is a little different for a homestead versus living in the city mm-hmm. and practical steps you can take. And to, Pam, I'm excited about that because we're figuring that out ourselves. And pantry management, <laughs> like, that's the cornerstone of the whole system is cooking and, and processing the food. You know, yep. you can grow food all day, but until you have an efficient system to cycle food in and out, it's not going to work. So I, I'm very personally, I'm just going to stop everything I'm doing during the festival and I'm going to be sitting <laughs> and just learning from you on that. I'm very excited about that. Well, it's really funny because I have an event here in two weeks called green chili weekend where people come and we get hatched chilies from New Mexico and eat them. Uh, but like I serve food at this event and today I was like, what's my shopping list? And my shopping list is corn tortillas right now. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I have everything else, mm. but I don't eat corn tortillas. So I do not have those here because I can't actually trust myself not to eat all the corn. <laughs> I, I so, know how that goes. Yeah, I was like, okay, well, that's what I need to get at the store. So we're done. <laughs> and I'm not going to make them from scratch. Uh, uh-uh. That's too much work for an event. So great. Well, thanks for being on today. Well, thank you for having me. This has been a great conversation. Yep. Why can't life just be one giant festival? That's what I want to know. Oh, wait, maybe it is if you make it that. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that conversation with Matt and that if you're in the area, you might consider going to the Back to the Land Festival, October 14th through 16th. With that, if you like the show and want to support the work I'm doing here, you can do it in a couple ways. One, get your coffee, which is awesome coffee, at hollerroast.com. Or two, become a member. Just head over to livingfreeintennessee.com, click on membership, and sign up. With that, guys, go out and make it a great week.